Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is the Right Reverend Eugene Sutton. He currently serves as pastor to the Chautauqua Congregation. Previous callings have been as Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Baltimore, where he continues to serve, Canon Pastor of the National Cathedral and for prayer and, and pilgrimage. He's a contributor to several books and has testified before the U.S. Congress recommending a commission to study the issues of slavery and racial discrimination. He's also appeared on National Public Radio, Fox News, and PBS. Bishop Sutton, how did you make your way to Chautauqua? Oh my gosh. Well, it was about 23 years ago or so when um, my wife actually was the one invited here to do something in music. She's a musician, uh, a pianist and choral director. And so we were here for several weeks and, um, and fell in love with it, here with our youngest son at the time. And so since that time, we've come off and on for the last 20 some years. Um, I've spoken a few times, um, uh, either in the Athenaeum or in the uh, Hall of Philosophy. And then I was Episcopal chaplain a few times. And then last year, we finally were able to, um, uh, to get our own place. We purchased a, a house in uh, Chautauqua. And then after that, I was asked to, uh, to come and serve on the staff. So you've made this long-term commitment then? Yes. So what are the responsibilities in your current p new position? Well, John, I'm learning that. I just started in residence about five, year, uh, five weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Sometimes seems like five years. <laughs> the time goes by quickly. And so in general, I have responsibility for the religious and spiritual life of the institution. Um, making sure that the worship services happen, who are the chaplains and, and are they um, uh, recruiting chaplains and making sure that they have all that they need. Designing the worship services, we do that as a, a bit of a team in the office and um, going around to the denominational houses and just being a general presence there. And if, if uh, someone has some significant pastoral or other needs while they're here, that's why I'm here. So if somebody um, had done something and they needed a pastor or they wanted to take a con have confession, uh -huh. then, then they might start? Well, I, I'll put it this way. It, it would gen generally have to be extraordinary because most people, uh, they will have their own faith community. Got it. They, uh, and each of the denominational houses have their own chaplain. Got it. And so they'll be an ordained person, whether they're Methodist or Baptist, Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian. Um, there are uh, 12 different, at least, 12 different denominations represented in various houses. So generally speaking, if I'm called in, it's because there is an institution-wide issue that Got needs a, a, a pastoral Got word. Got it. Now, what are the responsibilities of an Episcopal bishop? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, uh, how much time do we have? An hour and a half? <laughs> I can make it. Well, as Episcopal bishop, well, my diocese, for example, the Diocese of Maryland, it is the uh, largest of three Episcopal dioceses with Maryland congregations. Uh, the other one being Washington, the Diocese of Washington, which is D.C., and the surrounding counties around that. And then the Diocese of Maryland completely surrounds that. And then on the other side of the bay is the Diocese of Easton. There are a lot of Episcopal churches in Maryland. Back in the good old days when it was an Anglican colony, and then we, uh, I, I sometimes joke about that, but there are a lot of uh, churches. And so my diocese has 110. And so I visit each of the parishes, and generally um, it's called the, being the chief pastor for the clergy and for the people there. And except for the regular visits to the churches, when I'm usually called in, there's a problem. And um, uh, we need to straighten out the problem. It's hard work, is it not? It is. It, it is. Uh, it's long work. I've always, I've always worked hard. I've been ordained for 41 years. Mm -hmm. um, I began when I was seven, right? <laughs> but it was, um, and I've always been busy. But being bishop means you're heavily scheduled. There's just a lot going on. Very rewarding work. I get to do this. I would do it for free. Um, uh, to get to serve God in that way is a high privilege, but it's also a high responsibility 
And so sometimes it gets pretty hard and pretty rough and there are a lot of things going on and it's hard to stay on top of it all. Mm -hmm. So what are the trends in membership in the Episcopal Church? Well, like, uh, like church going in America, it's not very good in the aggregate. Uh, the most recent graphs show that no, all of the major denominations have lost membership, all of them, including uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, which for many years had been growing, the Methodist, Lutheran, um, they all are. The only ones that are showing a bit of an uptick are some non-denominational churches. Um, and some of those are mega churches. Although um, most of the non-denominational churches are really small congregations. But that's, uh, that follows the trends in the United States of fewer people uh, going to any religious institution. But also culturally, there are fewer people who are going to any institution. There's a, a lot of suspicion of established institutions of all types, Rotary Club, Lions, uh, uh, groups needing volunteer help. It's harder to get them, and the same for churches. It's not to say, though, that there aren't individual churches that are growing like mad. And, and uh, there are several in my diocese that are really uh, taking off. So in the Episcopal Church, nationally, like all the others, although among the mainline uh, non-Roman Catholic churches, uh, we've actually shown an uptick in the last uh, three years before COVID. Really? After COVID in 2000, it's hard for any of the denominations to know where we are because how do you count people anymore? And with so many services done online um, and where people staying away because of, of uh, being told constantly, don't go anywhere where there are a lot of people. That has a deleterious effect on churches. But here's my prediction. Go for it. Um, people, we are wired as human beings to always look to the beyond. And for most of us, yeah, there's, that's a spiritual need. There's something more than what we can readily see. And we, we, successful churches will help people to get connected to that something more, which we call God. And it'll help them get connected to others in their family and in their community. And it will help them get connected to their deepest selves. As long as we do that, um, it's gonna be around a long time. Many regimes have tried to stamp out religion. Um, uh, totalitarian regimes, communist regimes, uh, communist uh, uh, in China, in the former Soviet Union. You can't do it because it goes to the spirit. And people want to be free, and they want to be free to express themselves spiritually. So these things go like this over the history of time. But um, the graph will come up again. Good, good. I've seen this in Cuba. Yes. Young people, and it's just oh, yeah. very religious and, yeah. and, and shouts of joy, as they say. And you know, young people, young adults, are staying away from churches in droves. It's a phenomenon. But if you, if you really uh, try to be there for them in a particular way, it can have different results. So one of our churches, one of our new church starts in the city of Baltimore is, um, is really going great guns. Almost everybody is under the age of 40. They added another service and they're very successful. You can't tell me that young people are not interested in God. They just distrust a lot of the church. So we're, we're trying to regain trust because of abuses that some of our uh, brothers, mostly brothers and my sisters in other denominations especially, have uh, cast a pall over all of us. Indeed, indeed. Now, um, what are the differences between the Anglican Church and the Episcopal Church in the United States? Well, think about genus and species. Okay. Um, Every Episcopalian is an Anglican, but not every Anglican is an Episcopalian. Anglican is the adjective for anywhere where the Church of England went. And of course, the Church of England followed the British Empire all around the world. Mm -hmm. So after the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches, the Eastern Orthodox, the third largest communion of persons around the world are Anglicans, about 85 some million. Mm -hmm. The Episcopal Church 
is one of the constituent, um, um, uh, uh, I forget the exact word, uh, but parts of the uh, Anglican Communion. So um, now, there are though some who call themselves Anglican in the United States. They, they broke away from the Episcopal Church in the last hundred years and several in the last 10 years because of certain of our stances for full inclusion of all the baptized. And so that's an issue that's really rocking a lot of denominations and the same uh, for us. It, it wasn't a big split, but, um, but I would say maybe about a hundred across the nation congregations are calling themselves Anglican, not affiliated with the Episcopal Church, but they love the Book of Common Prayer and they love the way of worship. And, and so we'll, time will we'll, we'll test that out. Can we all get back together again? I have a good friend who just described his church as being Anglican. Yes. Now, what's the relationship between the Episcopal Church in the United States yeah. and the Bishop of Canterbury in Britain? Right, uh, great question. For many centuries, to be Anglican meant that you were recognized as such by the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's the spiritual head of the worldwide Anglican communion. Again, that 85 to 90 million people. Maybe like the Pope, except not, not with the authority of the Pope, because each of these 42 different provinces are really independent, but we agreed to pray together the Book of Common Prayer. We pray together and we do mission together. So um, the Episcopal Church is recognized by the Archbishop of Canterbury as one of the Anglican churches. Um, some Episcopal churches will say Episcopal slash Anglican, especially if they're in a areas where a number of immigrants are coming from other parts of the Anglican world. And they will say, well, where is the nearest Anglican church? They may not recognize the word Episcopal, but they recognize the word Anglican. So um, again, every Episcopalian is an Anglican. Some, but Anglicans are only about, um, Episcopalians in the American context are only about two million Got it. of that 90 million. Got it. Now, tell me about the, um, Episcopal or Anglican Church in Africa? Yes, um, that is the largest, those provinces in, in Africa are the largest, uh, growing like mad, just many of them. The churches in um, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Rwanda, uh, Uganda, uh, a lot of uh, churches in Africa. Um, and they tend to be more conservative than the American church. But, um, but, so far, we still agree to pray together. Some of those churches uh, have a problem with the Anglican Communion because so many of the provinces now in the Anglican Communion say there are no barriers for whoever you are to be ordained in this church. If you're oriented to the same gender, you're a child of God. It's not a sin to be <coughs> oriented in, in, in that way. Sin is only when you abuse other people and you, you abuse who you are. And so we hold gay and lesbian people to the same standards as a people who are, the majority of people, of course, the great majority, who are heterosexual. So if one, if heterosexuals can be married, they should be able to be married. They're not going to change their orientation, but we want people to have proper ethics not promiscuity, not just out there for everyone, but a committed monogamous relationship. And so we have the same ethical standards for everyone. And we, we believe that we're following the ethics of Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And I've been, I've been serving Christ uh, ever since I made a decision to follow Jesus at 17 years old. I may have different views than some of my more traditional uh, brothers and sisters. But I read the scriptures every day, I pray, and uh, we're serving the same God. I think God weeps when we say, oh, because I disagree with you, I want nothing to do with you. 
what would Jesus say? Mm -hmm. I think that hurts us all. Got it. That, that's sort of a part of popular culture, that question. Yes, yes. Now, um, are there any other major differences in the uh, theology of the African, con African church? Well, um, uh, the issues of human sexuality and gender and gender identity right. are the big issues right now that divide. Okay. Now, here's an interesting thing. We will agree on basically 95% of everything. We mm -hmm. all hold to the Nicene Creed, the ancient creeds, um, the role of Jesus, um, uh, the Trinity, uh, all of the major doctrines. And all. We agree on just so many. Only on some areas of, of, um, of ethics do we disagree. I just find it amazing, why do we divide over those relatively small issues, um, but not on other issues. That's one. Two, uh, Jesus spent a lot of time in the scriptures, a lot of time, a lot of energy talking about how we treat one another. Jesus was a lot less concerned about what you're doing to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's what you're doing to others. He spoke many, many times about issues of justice and greed and hoarding of wealth. And all. But for so many of churches, they'll never oust anyone for being greedy <laughs> or, <laughs> or things like that. But if they're oriented to the same gender and all that, no, you are outcast. I, I think that's very, very wrong. And the church, writ large, has made many mistakes in the, in the last centuries. And sometimes we're just wrong. Yeah. The church was wrong about slavery. The church was wrong about God can never call a woman to, um, to teach over men. The church was wrong about Copernicus and Galileo. The church was wrong about left-handedness. For many times, we, are you left-handed? There, there was a time when that was a symbol. Uh, they used the left hand, you know, in Latin, in French, sinistre, left. It was sinister. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a sign that maybe you were a witch if you were a woman. And churches even said, something must be wrong with you. You are willfully trying to use the left hand. Why don't you be like the majority and do it right with the right-handed? Well, John, there is much more diversity in God's creative genius than we can get our finite human minds around. Right. And as long as we keep trying to say that... Um, we have the truth, which means the majority of people are this way and believe that, so that's the truth, and all others, well, you're damned. Got it. We got to get away from that. Got it. And so that's... That's easy. That's, where, that, that's really where I am, and we're, we're just trying to preach the gospel of love. Now, let me go to a much easier yeah. question. Tell me about biblical translations, and, and if somebody would come to you... Yeah and want to um, have a church experience, a nun, yes. and a Winnie, what, what translation might you start reading? And, and how would you well, go down the pike? You know, I thought you were saying, now for easier questions. <laughs> 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 the first ones were easy. Well, um, uh, here's the thing. No one English translation came down from heaven and saying this one is better than all the others. It depends on which speaks to that person. We generally use in our church the New Revised Standard Version, and that's, that's the standard for us. But sometimes, um, if the Good News Bible and put it, it puts it in very vernacular, plain English, I've used that sometimes. I've used um, a, a paraphrase of the scriptures by Eugene Peterson. Very helpful sometimes. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, Eugene, yeah, he was a Presbyterian pastor. God rest his soul. He died uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, there, it, it will all get you there. I can't believe that the Holy Spirit would be blocked from active, acting in your life because you used one translation over another. So I, I, I would begin with the New Revised Standard because that's generally 
the standard English for now, but New International Version NIV is good too. Uh, even though I do, ha I do have some problems with uh, newer translations, I'll give you one. Um, in so many places, in the Old and the New Testaments, uh, let's say the New Testament, uh, around Jesus' birth, there would be a proclamation. And behold, the multitudes of angels glorified God, saying, glory to God in the highest, and peace and goodwill towards all. And then Anna and Sapphira, behold, the angels, behold. And Jesus would say, behold, I come. In the new translations, it's see. S-E-E. -E. And I actually preach whole sermons on this. I, th I don't think C has the weight of behold. Indeed. And so although the new translations uh, are right, no one goes around saying behold. Mm -hmm. Everybody, uh, I think they've lost something in the majesty of the language. And you know what, John? That's one of the reasons why I was attracted to my branch of the Jesus movement when I was a young adult, the Episcopal Church, because there's still a belief in the majesty of the language and the glory of the language. And sometimes we just say ancient prayers. Well, we do it a lot and we don't change them because it's beautiful, it's glorious, and it's better than what I could come up with on the spot, even though I do that sometimes. But let the language also be beautiful and glorifying to God rather than Oh, God, I was just in the neighborhood and I'm thinking this. That's not a prayer. I think the Book of Common Prayer exemplifies that. I agree. What, what year Book of Common Prayer would you, given a free, free well, choice? Well, it's funny. We've said for many years. No the, easy questions. The new, the new prayer book, the 1979 prayer book. Well, good gosh, I had a woman in my congregation who uh, said, no, that's, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, well, I'll put it this way. Now, 1979 was the last revision. That was a long time ago. Um, and undoubtedly, it will be revised. And here's what's going to happen. There will be ringing of, of, and wrangling of hands and gnashing of teeth and wailing because people will say, oh, you've changed the prayer book. But guess what? Every age has change. And so what do we do? No matter what your faith may be, and I'm a, I'm a devoted Christian, and the closer I get to what I call Christ, the closer I get to every other human being. And so I'm not judging anyone. And if you're Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, or no faith, you are my sister, you are my brother. So, but uh, every age has to translate the message in their own culture in their own time and so that a lot of what people say that's the tradition now well that's just the tradition that they remember growing up but in fact it was a new thing very small example we pass the plate in many of our churches for the collection mm -hmm. the offering that was an innovation that caused an uproar it did <laughs> yes because, because for so long, not only in the Episcopal Church, but others, um, you, you rented pews or you, you had a share that you just gave, but you wouldn't dare go around and do the offering. Well, that was an innovation. The organ, we venerate the organ now. Do you realize the uproar that it caused in many places in Europe that they're now using organ? And the church is that kind of music and singing some of those songs that people were singing at the local pub. And then they put Christian words to it. Everything's an, an, an innovation. And the key as a spiritual leader is to how do, you, how do you hold on to tradition, but also embrace the new. And I, churches that are successful will hold those in tension. Mm -hmm. Some churches, and religious uh, institutions, they're very good at tradition. But you can't get a new thing in there, a new thought or anything, and slowly they will die. And in other churches, it just seems like every new thing, every new theology, every new way of worshiping, uh, it, it's just always new, but you get the sense that they've lost the central core of the For message. Sure. 
So you got to keep those in balance. Jesus did. Jesus' main um, uh, 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 people who were against him were the traditionalists because they thought he was going too far. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he said, no, I haven't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've, came to, I've come to fulfill it. It just was in a new way to people, and so that caused consternation. So in my church, and what I'm trying to do at Chautauqua, mm-hmm. Chautauqua has many traditions. It does. These are time-honored traditions. We need to honor these traditions. And yet we, we want to institute some new things as well, but you don't do one without the other. Indeed. Indeed. Let's, let's tell me a little bit about, I got two questions. Tell me a little bit about what the National Cathedral is mm-hmm. and, and what your responsibilities are. What the significance of that, that church is? Yes, Washington National Cathedral is the other great national treasure I've seen. I am so fortunate. I'm now involved with two national treasure, religious treasures in America, some of the, two of the most prominent, and they have similarities. The National Cathedral is the Episcopal Cathedral in Washington, mm-hmm. that great Gothic building. But it's also um, the only church that was chartered by Congress in 1893 really? to be a great church for national purposes. That's official. Now, it doesn't mean it's government owned. It gets no government money, strict separation between church and state. But realizing the vision of George Washington and others that there ought to be some symbol of faith in this country. And so um, uh, the Episcopal Church took that on. Uh, so it's a great church, and many of the, all of the funerals of the presidents are there, and when the nation needs to mourn, it's there, when it needs to celebrate, a great gathering place. But it's also in fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah, a house of prayer for all people. Now, in the 19th century, it was thought to be basically Christians. Mm-hmm. But now we know all people, the nation is much more diverse. So look at this, you're an Episcopal cathedral, but you're also, in, you do services for the, our nation, but also interfaith. In a similar way, Chautauqua Indeed. is a local community. And even in the short time I've been here this summer, I see tensions between those who've been here a very long time. And I think, and sometimes rightly, they may feel our traditions are going, or, you know, don't we matter? But Chautauqua is also a national institution. And so how can you be both? You got to hold them in tension. But that means sometimes um, when the institution wants to say, if we're national, we're going to have to act as national people. And, and, and maybe it means you got to have some people working not just around Chautauqua, but in other places like Washington. Well, that's, that's a loss for some because now Chautauqua is spreading out, but then it's national. So those are intention. And I would say the National Cathedral's um, mission is not that dissimilar from Chautauqua's. Where can you have great uh, uh, conversations about the great issues of the day? Um, and from the standpoint of science and the humanities and in, in, the, in the arts, and in Chautauqua's case, you had recreation, but all in the context of faith. Where can you go and not be embarrassed to say, I'm a person of faith, I'm a Christian. That's right. And yet I embrace Brian Green, the scientist who was here uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I embrace the arts and supporting the arts and the full person, that, uh, that's a great mission. And I think it's a national resource. The Chautauqua Institution is a national resource. And we, if people would come here, they would see this is a special place. Indeed. And if they go to the National Cathedral, as soon as they're in there and they see what happens, they'll go, this is unique. There's no other church like it. Indeed. We are out of time, but I got one last yeah. question I yeah. can't resist. Yeah. You're a man of great stature. You're, you're a short t- tenure here. You're loved by the community. Mm. 
A Yogeshwar Thakwan comes to you and says, Bishop, I think I'm called for a career in the ministry. What should I do? What would your counsel be? Oh my gosh. Uh, one is I would be so happy for them because here's what's happened. They have had a spiritual awakening mm -hmm. and they hear a call. You are called to serve. And the first thing I would say to them is, you heard that call, you need to do something about that. It may resort in ordination or it may not because right now you just heard a call to minister but there are lay ministers and clergy ministers and all that. But the church or your, your religious institution has to discern with you what is the nature of that call. So that's the first thing. Second thing is um, I was a very fortunate person. A year out of college, I went into uh, corporate America and made some money and then went to seminary. Uh, uh, because I heard that call. I was ordained at 26 years old. I'm 69 now. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no more rewarding vocation out there than to serve people and to try to mediate the divine presence uh, within them. Now, for regular members of the church, it's not as easy. Uh, as bishop, well, as, uh, as your pastor, the, past, the pastor is the, servant, the servants of God. Mm -hmm. The bishops are the servants of the servants of God. The pew members are those with servant problems. You have to take a moment of that. That was my best joke. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I would encourage them and say, there's, there's no more rewarding Thing than to be able to talk about God and be a witness for God and I'm a witness for Jesus and uh, join the bandwagon whether you are ordained or not join this bag bandwagon because this is a great caravan this is a great train of, of love and I joined the church to change the world I really did Mm -hmm. I wanted to change myself too I, wanted, I, I needed salvation I was going down the wrong path but also, it's not just about me or you. It's about the world. That's right. And when you hear that call, it's like, what are you doing to make the world a more loving, merciful, compassionate, and just place for everybody? And then we're all joyous. Indeed. So there it is. That's fantastic. This yeah. has been terrific. Thank it you. It really is. Thank, I, you, thank so you so very much for coming and sharing at the table. Thank you. Do come back. All right.